We're hearing? Yep, yep. Good morning. Good morning. It's always fun. This is the early crowd in here. These are the ones, like, the on-timers, I'll say. So, y'all did good. Y'all are here, and then the crowd will come over the next few minutes. It's so good to worship with you all this morning. Welcome to Christ Community Church. My name is Lucas. I'm on staff here. I work with our youth and do some of our outreach events. If this is your first, second time here, if you've been coming for a little while and have never been able to take the time to fill out a visitor card or a welcome card, I would encourage you to do that. It should be right in front of you unless you're on the front row, and that's my family, so they, you know, if you want to fill one out, I know who y'all are. Um, but we would love to, to take that. It's just a little bit of contact information. It's a chance for us to, to reach out and, and get to know those who were, were able to worship with us uh, over the last week or two. We, we like to think of the people that come not as visitors but as guests. Visitors are, are unexpected. Guests are expected. You pray for them. You, you are excited to see them. You prepare a place for them. So uh, we, we have been doing that as well. We would love to know who our guests were and, and, and to learn about your time here with us. If you have any questions about the church or anything, it's a great chance to learn about that as well. We have a few things coming up on the calendar as we get into our fall rhythm, our our full swing of things. The the first one that we have is another Next Step luncheon. So again, if you're kind of in that welcome card crowd or if you've been coming for just a little while and have not yet been to a Next Step luncheon, we would love to invite you to that. It's it's a chance to have a free lunch right after the second service. You get to learn a little bit more about uh, the church's background, uh, where, where God has taken us, where we hope that God will take us in the future, some of the uh, associations that we have and, and some of the things that, you know, we, that makes us distinct as a local body of believers. We would love to invite you to that, um, but please, it, it always helps us kind of forecast enough food. If you reach out at office at christ.community, that would help us RSVP. We do have child care available, so uh, moms and dads of little ones, we would love to watch, uh, watch over those guys while y'all get to get to know the church a little bit better. All right, now we've got like three announcements coming up for September 17th. September 17th is like the day of days, right? So if you have not been baptized or if you have interest in baptism or maybe uh, maybe you all have a, a child that has expressed interest in baptism and you just want to learn a little bit more about how our church practices baptism, what we view baptism as, uh, shorthand, it's a in, uh, an external proclamation of an internal transformation, but we would love to spend more time going through how we practice baptism and, and for those who have not yet been baptized to prepare for that public display of, of, of love for Christ and obedience to him. That'll happen right after our second service two weeks from now. So if you uh, want to get baptized and show up next week, we're going to talk about joining the church. It's, you know, you got to know your timing. Two weeks from now after the second service, we'll have a baptism class. You can email Stephen at Christ.community. He's right here. He would love to let you know if you have any questions about getting baptized. All right. There's something in between baptism and the members meeting. Uh, at four o'clock, our women's DG will gather together. I think, no, no, no. That'll be men. That'll be men. Yeah. Uh, our men's DG will gather together uh, at 4 o'clock, and then right at the end of the men's DG, uh, we'll have child care available, but we will have another members meeting here in the church house at 6.15 p.m. I'm going through a, a course right now, and, and one of the resources we're going through just talks about how life-giving it is to have an involved and active church membership, not just church leadership. Um, you could have, you know, the world's greatest leaders up front, but if you don't have an actively engaged church membership, it, it's not really going to go anywhere. And so it's been great to see the participation from this local body, and we would, I would encourage you, if at all possible, uh, I checked the schedule. The Cowboys are not playing then. They will have already lost by then anyways. So, sorry. Whoa. Um, that we would love, we'd love to have some time there. We're going to talk about uh, some things that, uh, as we start to prepare for 2024. I mean, I know you know the the end of the year uh, doesn't seem uh, that close, but we actually have to start preparing as a body for what uh, the Lord might be leading us to into the future. So we'll talk about that and, and some other outreach events that we're excited and getting ready for. So 6:15 on September 17th here at the church house member meeting. Men, we are kicking it off tonight. We got our first DG of the fall semester. Some small claps. I like, no, you can do like a big clap if you want. Yeah. 
Men's DG, we're, we are excited to gather together. We're going to be going through a, a book uh, written by Paul David Tripp called Do You Believe? Um, so men are first in the shoot. We will be here this Sunday. Next week, uh, we'll alternate. Women will be here. So uh, I'll go ahead and break it, uh, break it down for you. Men, you are not babysitting your kids next week. You are watching your kids. That's, that's okay. Uh, but we're giving that time so that our women could, could be here next week. But tonight, uh, guys, right here at the church house, 4 o'clock p.m., we would love to have you here. I think that's all of our announcements, so will you please stand and join me in our call to worship. As, uh, as we prepare our hearts, it's always good to remember uh, the, the joy that we have for the Lord. Um, so I'm going to read this. Uh, let it seep, seep down into your heart as we prepare to sing. From Psalm 5, verse 11. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them shout for joy forever. May you shelter them and may those who love your name boast about you. Let's, let's worship. I was an orphan lost at the fall. Running away when I'd hear you call. Father, you work your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you love me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation. Predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. Say that same grace and grace alone. your home to seek out the lost. You do the great and terrible cost. I got you. Jesus, your face was sad. I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. Spirit, you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone Spirit, you moved in me At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkened heart, the bride of Christ has shone Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven citizen by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. And a flood is welling up behind my eyes So I eat the tears I cry And if that were not enough 
They know just the words to cut and tear and prod When they ask me, where's your God? Why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I can remember when you showed your face to me as it depends for water so my soul thirsts for you and when i behold your glory you so faithfully renew like a bed of grass for my fainting flesh i am satisfied in you When I'm staring at the ground, it's an inbred feedback loop that brings me down. So it's time to lift my brow and remember better days when I love to worship you in all your ways with the sweetest songs of praise. Oh, my soul, why so disturbed within me? I can remember when you showed your grace to me as a deep pain. about your faithfulness that my pain reveal your glory as my only real rest that my loss is shown and your waves crash down on me I'll recall your safety scheme You're the one who made the waves and your son went out to suffer in my place and to tell me that I'm safe why am I down? Why so disturbed? I am satisfied in you. 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 Amen. Y'all can take a seat. Whenever we read that verse, I think one of the things that stands out to me is the fact that it speaks to where we are so often. 
that all of us have these anxious thoughts. All of us has this agony that fills our mind. And there seems to be rising up within our mind, within our hearts, within our lives, even this, this, this cloud that hangs over us. And we have to confess that when we read what the Bible says about anxiousness and anxiety, that oftentimes anxiousness and anxiety exists because our trust is not fully in God. We're not looking, we're not trusting that God will protect and provide and fulfill his promises to us. And so when we look at anxiety and and agony in that way, one of the things that we need to do is we need to confess it to God. So let's take the next few moments and silently take our anxious concerns in the agony of our mind, lay it before the feet of our God and confess, Father, forgive me for my lack of faith. Forgive me for my lack of trust. And may I find peace in you. Let's do that now. The psalmist continues in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 5. He says, But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. Heavenly Father, we say we believe. Help our unbelief. We trust you, but help our doubts. You, time and time and time again, have proven your faithful love to us in our lives and throughout the course of history through the giving of your son for our sins Lord you have proven your faithful love so help us to rejoice in our deliverance we have through him help us to trust that you care for us in every aspect of our lives and we pray this in Jesus' name amen Christ Community Church I want to remind you that when your trust is in Christ Whenever your hope is in Christ and you confess your sins, your sins are forgiven and you have this right relationship with God. Thanks be to God. We always do this time of confession and assurance of pardon right before we come to the ceremony of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is what we call a covenant renewal ceremony. That every time we take of this cup, every time we take this bread, what we are redoing is we are renewing the covenant that we have with Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are saying, every time my trust and my hope is in you, I'm dedicating my life, Jesus, to you. So if you are a follower of Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a member at Christ Community Church or not. If you are a faithful follower of Jesus, we invite you to participate in this ceremony with us. However, if you don't know Christ, if Jesus isn't your Lord and Savior, what we would just ask you to do is when you come forward, just pass the elements by. Just say, not today, Pastor, and we, what we'll do is we'll pray a prayer of blessing over you, and, and that will be it. And the reason we do this is because if you do not profess Christ with your mouth intentionally, We wouldn't want you to do it unintentionally by taking these elements. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. So when we take them as the people of God, we rejoice in the truth of of what Christ has done for us. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he was with the disciples in the upper room. And whenever he was with them, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. He said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, then, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood, blood which is shed for the forgiveness of many sins. And we are reminded by the Apostle Paul that as often as we eat this bread and as often as we drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ until he comes again. So this morning, Christ Community Church, we are all evangelists proclaiming the glories of Christ through the taking of these elements. Let's do it now together.
All right, a few are in elementary, so kindergarten through fourth grade. Your teachers are waiting for you in the back to take you back to Children's Church. All right, good morning. All right, reading comes from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot, horses, and 50 men to run before him. He would get up early and stand beside the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone had a grievance to bring before the king for settlement, Absalom called out to him and asked, What city are you from? If he replied, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel, Absalom said to him, Look, Your claims are good and right, but the king does not have anyone to listen to you. He added, if only someone would appoint me judge in the land, then anyone who had a grievance or dispute could come to me, and I would make sure he received justice. When a person approached to pay homage to him, Absalom reached out his hand, took hold of him, and kissed him. Absalom did this to all the Israelites who came to the king for a settlement. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. When four years had passed, Absalom said to the king, Please, let me go to Hebron to fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. For your servant made a vow when I lived in Geshur of Aram, saying, If the Lord really brings me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. Go in peace, the king said to him. So he went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent agents throughout the tribes of Israel with this message. When you hear the sound of the ram's horn, you are to say, Absalom has become king in Hebron. 200 men from Jerusalem went with Absalom. They had been invited and were going innocently, for they did not know the whole situation. While he was offering the sacrifices, Absalom sent for David's advisor, Ahithophel, the Gilanite, from his city of Gilo. So the conspiracy grew strong, and the people supporting Absalom continued to increase. Then an informer came to David and reported, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all the servants with him in Jerusalem, Get up, we have to flee, or we will not escape from Absalom. Leave quickly, or he will overtake us quickly, heap disaster on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. The king's servants said to the king, Whatever my lord the king decides, we are your servants. Then the king set out, and his entire household followed him. But he left behind ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out, and all the people followed him. They stopped at the last house while all his servants marched past him. Then all the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and the people of Gath, 600 men who came with him from there, marched past the king. The king said to Ittai of Gath, Why are you also going with us? Go back and stay with the new king, since you're both a foreigner and an exile from your homeland. Besides, you only arrived yesterday. Should I make you wander around with us today while I go wherever I can? Go back and take your brothers with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. But in response, Ittai vowed to the king, As the Lord lives and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king is, whether it means life or death, your servant will be there. March on, David replied to Ittai. So Ittai of Gath marched past with all his men and the dependents who were with him. Everyone in the countryside was weeping loudly while all the people were marching out of the city. As the king was crossing the Kidron Valley, all the people were marching past on the road that leads to the wilderness. Zadok was also there, and all the Levites with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set the Ark of God down, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until the people had finished marching past. Then the king instructed Zadok, "'Return the Ark of of God to the city.'" If I find favor with the Lord, he will bring me back and allow me to see both it and its dwelling place. However, if he should say, I do not delight in you, then here I am. He can do with me whatever pleases him. The king also said to the priest Zadok, Look, return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, your son Ahimeaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan. Remember, I'll wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and stayed there. 
David was climbing the slope of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he ascended. His head was covered, and he was walking barefoot. All of the people with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they ascended. Then someone reported to David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Lord, David pleaded, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. When David came to the summit where he used to worship God, Hushai the Archite was there to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you go away with me, you'll be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and tell Absalom, I will be your servant, your majesty. Previously, I was your father's servant, but now I will be your servant. Then you can counteract Ahithophel's counsel for me. Won't the priest of Zadok and Abiathar be there with you? Report everything you hear from the palace to the priests, Zadok and Abiathar. Take note, their two sons are there with them, Zadok's son Ahimeaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan. Send them to tell me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's personal advisor, entered Jerusalem just as Absalom was entering the city. This is the word of the Lord. All right. Thank you, Ralph. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you again. Um, if we haven't met, my name is Lucas. And I get to serve on staff here. I'm thankful to spend this time here studying with you in God's Word. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 15 today. If you haven't already turned there, I would recommend go, go ahead and getting there. And while we're settling in today, has anyone, has anyone else ever had an experience of of getting excited for something, get, getting ready to, you know, go out on a trip or, or go experience something, watch a new movie or something, and it just didn't quite meet your expectations. It, it just fell short a little bit of what you had built up in your mind or in your heart. When I was young, when I was probably in kindergarten or first grade, my dad and I were just so excited to, to get ready to go to, I guess, every kid's like rite of passage in Texas is Six Flags Over Texas. So we were getting ready to go. There was a roller coaster that we were ready to go. Judge, Judge Roy Scream, that was the name of, uh, of, of that roller coaster. We were so excited. Like every day that he would drop me off at school, we would count down like 15 days to, to, to Judge Roy Scream, you know, that, that fun stuff you get to do with your dad. And then we, the day finally comes, we get to go ride it, and I would argue that we probably had two different experiences of this roller coaster. <laughs> For him, I mean, a grown man who's ridden roller coasters before, although he is a little bit of a, of a featherweight when it comes to theme parks and rides, I mean, it was just a few hills, and then you kind of turn around once, and you go up, a, up and down a few hills, and then you're back done, uh, you, you know? Well and easily worth the hour-long wait with, uh, with your kid and several other kids, Right. Uh, but for a five-year-old or six-year-old, I can't even remember how old I was at the time, it was a terrifying life-or-death experience <laughs> that I bragged to everyone when I got back home that I survived this, this ride, right? Remember that. I mean, so for my dad, it probably wasn't what he all had, had it built up. And, and for me, it was even greater than my wildest expectations. There was this theme of, of, kind, of kind of failure and fulfillment at the same time. As we study today in Samuel, or 2 Samuel chapter 15, we're, we're going to, to, to get to a similar theme of failure and fulfillment. We're, we're reaching a new part of the story where, where some storylines have kind of been building for the last few weeks, the last few chapters, and, and it's culminating in the tragedy that we encounter over the next few weeks where we see a family ripped apart by violence, by anger, by greed, by all these different sins. And, and, and this, is, this is really in a microcosm, the, the Bible's unique story and, and unique solution to this story. You and I, we, we are failures. We, we are sinners who face a much greater consequence for our actions, our deeds, our heart disposition towards the Lord than you or I would ever like to admit. But there is hope. There is a solution found within the scriptures that's found nowhere else. It's found in the man who was God. It was found in Jesus Christ who was sent by God to redeem us from the sins that we have, that we have committed, that we have felt, that we have thought by taking the full weight of God's holy justice on his shoulders when it should have been on ours. 
So if that is true, if what we encounter in today's passage is true, we should be a people who are encouraged by just how much God has provided for us, by just how much God has given for his people and, and uh, provided for them in their walk with him. And we should, we should be worshipful. We, we, we should be amazed at what God has done, even in the worst moments that we might encounter, up to and including a family falling apart all around us. We are able to worship God because of who he is and what he has done. Our title today is Failures and Fulfillment. Failures and Fulfillment. People fail in every way, but God is always faithful. People fail in every way, but God is always faithful. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Oh God, our Father, we, we thank you for the chance to worship you today, to, to sing, to gather, um, to remember through communion, um, to, to, to experience all these different aspects of, of worship and, and encountering and celebrating who you are. Now we, we encounter your word. Um, God, this is a a hard passage of scripture. This is where we really engage with, with ideas that, that confront us with, of, of the failure that we have in our own heart, of who we are utterly without you. But God, I just pray that through this, we see that you are the fulfillment of our hope, of our joy, of our peace, that we find fulfillment in you over anything else that we are comforted by the knowledge of who you are and what you have done for us, and that you send us out today more in love with you than when we first entered. Father, we love you so much. We trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are going to go through three different sections in this long chapter. The first section will be verses 1 through 12, and we are going to see a, a revolt, a defiant son. We're going to see a son that defies his father. And then in a short passage from uh, verses 13 through 18, we are going to see a king who flees his city. We're going to see the failures of men, and then we are going to contrast them to the, to the providence, to the devotion, to, to the promise-keeping God in the last section. We're going to see a Lord who keeps his promises. We have to get there first, though, which means we have to go through the son who defies his father. The son defies his father in verses 1 through 12. Absalom is trying to, to, to claim and climb up to the throne of his father, of his dad. And he does this through three different manners. I know my, my big points weren't all in perfect alliteration, but I promise the Baptist in me kept it going. He does this through pride. He does it through promise and popularity. So let's, let's go through and see in our first few verses here how he does this. Through his pride. In verse 1, the first two verses say, after this. Again, that's always linking us to something. It's, it's after this, after the events of chapter 13 and the events of chapter 14, when Absalom tries to take justice into his own hands, when he tries to, to execute righteousness by executing a brother for sexual violence committed against their sister, he, he, he does this uh, in a moment of, of cold-blooded murder. And then he, he, he runs from his father's presence. He, he refuses to be in the same area as the king. It takes the king, one of the king's great servants, Joab, to finally bring the two into the same room together. And it's sort of a, a, a tenuous piece at best. There's, there's a little bit of, of paying homage. There's a little bit of kissing of, of uh, the, the father to the son. But you can see that it's not really a, a strong bond. And, and, it, and we see it break here in chapter 15. So after this, Absalom lets his presence Pride take over. He got he got himself a chariot, horses, and fifty men to run before him. These are just simple ways of saying he was making himself a mighty man. He was proclaiming to himself all the accoutrements, all the all the things that come with being a king. He's saying these are mine. I am a great man, and and, and he says that you know I will accomplish great things through me. He, that's the next thing that he does. He offers a promise to people. In, ver, in the second half of verse 4, he says, if people came to me, then anyone who had a grievance or dispute, who had something done wrong to them, who, who people were questioning right or wrong, I would give them justice. I would be the source of right and wrong. I would be able to fix all things and make them the way they used to be. 
He does it through his pride. He does it through a promise. And then he does it through popularity. In verses 5 and 6, whenever someone comes to see the king, he, he brings them over to him and he, he gives them a kiss, the kiss of, uh, of, of right rule to, to pay homage. He, he says, I will be the one to give you that justice. He, he gives them the promise and he did this to all the Israelites who came to the king. Do you see what he's doing there? He's, he's siphoning off those who are coming to his father, and he's saying, I will be able to give you what you want. I am the king that you truly need in this moment. We see the actions here. We, we see the, 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 the absolute wrongdoing that Absalom is committing. We, we see the, the, the discontent and the actions, but we kind of wonder, where did this all come from? Where did this all start? If you look in the first half of verse 4, that's where it is. You see a discontent heart. He added, if only someone would appoint me judge in the land. If only I were in charge. If only things were the way I thought they should be. If only people would see me the way that I saw me. Then things would be made right. The Bible is an ancient book. But my goodness, if that is not the secular cry today, I don't know what is. If only things were the way that I thought they should be. I mean, how many times have you talked to someone about work or talked to someone about school? And when they talk about it, you hear how, how much better things would be if, if work was run the way that I ran it. Or, or if, if the teachers taught the things that, that I thought they should teach, right? But in a way, we're expressing our own desire. If only things were the way that I designed them to be. Look, I came from the military, a strict hierarchical organization, and I can promise you that never happens in the military. Am I right? Okay, the chuckles are kind of helping me out here. It's full of people saying, if only this guy above me would listen or do things the right way, or when I'm there, I will have it right. I mean, Absalom's cry is our own. If only I were the judge. If only I were in charge. But that's that's the root cause. That's, that's his discontent. And then it's, it's bubbling out into this awful fruit. We see the actual fruit at the end of verse 6. Absalom stole. He stole the hearts of the men of Israel. I grabbed a picture here. This is, a, this is an apple tree. Uh, it looks like a Granny Smith apple tree. I love Granny Smith apples. But you can tell it's unhealthy. It's disease. There's something wrong. I don't believe any of us would want to confidently take one of these, these fruits and eat them ourselves, right? Now, you wonder what might be wrong. Is there a bug? Is there a drought? Is there a blight? What, what, what is on this? This apple tree has been diagnosed with phytophthora. Phytophthora. That's a fun word to say. Um, lots of P's and H's and all sorts of fun, fun deals there. Uh, phytophthora is a disease of the roots. This tree is dying from underneath the ground. This tree has no hope to bear any good fruit because of the problem with the roots that are underneath it. And, and it's saying here, if only, if only things were right, I, I could produce good fruit. But, but the roots have already been rotten. And, and we see that that's no longer the case. This is a sad statement, but it's one that's true. This is not a, a unique problem to people who work out there, who live out there outside of the church this has permeated church culture, and there are lots of times where we encounter abuses or, or misuses of the, the, the biblical power or the biblical authority that has been given by God through church leaders. I've, I've worked under church leaders that struggle with this idea of if only things were the way I wanted them, then we would really be off to a great start. Then we would be doing things the way God wanted us to be. And I could say, I, I just want to affirm, uh, actually, that none of them are in here right now, so uh, I'll Trust, I'll, I'll say, trust me, I said this in the second service. Uh, I want to affirm to our pastors and, and to you that, that these are men that God has called and placed, and they are serving this place, this, this local body, um, with a great fear of the Lord, with a great desire and submission to his word. And so it gives me great confidence for, for, for this church body that they, are being, that they are being led by godly men, godly men and women in our ministries, a, a, a community-shaped by the gospel that is underneath the word of God. I just want to say that uh, I want to affirm that for this congregation that, that you get to, get to have the blessing of, of a church that is not led astray of those who are always crying out, if only things were my way. They're constantly saying, what is God's way for this body? But the fruit 
The, 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 the problem that comes out of Absalom's discontent is in verse 6. He stole the hearts of men. He stole the hearts of God's people. The last time that I was talking up here in, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we understood that, that David took something. God gave him all these things, but yet David was not satisfied. He had to take more than what he was given. And now look, he has a son who takes more than what he has been given. We have a father who stole a woman from a man, a wife from a husband, and now we have a son who steals a kingdom, a throne from his father. And David does not deal with the problem at hand. He refuses to deal with the problem that, that his son has caused. Four years go by of this, of this continued rebellious nature and attitude against his father. And then Absalom comes and speaks to the king and says, let me go out. I, I want to go worship the Lord. Yeah, right. We see what he does pretty quickly out there. And David even allows it. He gives his son the room and the space and the breathing space to go out and, and foment this rebellion and to continue growing and consolidating his power. Another important verse is right at the end of our section. In chapter 11, he says that Absalom leads 200 innocent men out of, out of Jerusalem into Hebron. Again, I cannot stress enough to you the importance of godly leaders of God's people. Because very quickly, if they are built on their own principles, upon their own desires and wants, they will lead innocent people astray. The Bible is full of rebukes. Read Jeremiah chapter 34. Read the gospel of Matthew as Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and see what God thinks of those who lead his people astray. But for you and I, we need to be willing to ask ourselves a hard question. Do we want something as badly as Absalom wanted his father's throne? I mean, do we want prominence among our family or, or those that we work with? Do we want to be known? Is our cry just like Absalom? If only, if only, if only things were the way I wanted them. I would challenge you to ask someone you trust, typically someone close to you, you know, maybe a family member or a friend, to say, is there something in my heart that's gotten bigger than the Lord? And, you know, be prepared for the answer. Uh, sometimes it might be true. Sometimes uh, it might not be. But I, I just pray that we uh, see constantly the sins that could even blind our own eyes and let others speak that truth into us. We have a son who defies a father. He has failed as a son. Man fails in all ways, but God is always faithful. Then we see a king. A king who flees his city, who abandons the, the, the area, the, the, the city that God has placed him over. While the family aspect cannot be overlooked, it is a father and son at strife, at war with one another. At a higher level, we have to acknowledge that this is a king having to abandon his kingdom and the city that he was called to lead. In verse 14, it says, David says to all the servants, once they realize that the hearts of the men of Israel have been stolen, it doesn't matter how they got there, they're no longer with him. He says, I know that my son, the, the prince of Israel, might say that he is a source of justice and peace, but I, I, he's going to bring anything but that. He, he's going to bring the sword to his people, to those who are not uh, with him. He's, rather than peace and justice, there's going to be vengeance and violence instead. These are the continued effects of the sin that David has committed in the past as Israel's king. It's a fulfillment of 2 Samuel chapter, 11, ver chapter 12, verse 11. Whenever, whenever Nathan rebukes David for taking Bathsheba from Uriah, whenever stealing a wife from a husband, the Lord says through Nathan, I am going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I, I'm going to take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes. It's saying that the, the chickens are coming home to roost. That this is, this is the problem that you have created. And guess what? The promised retribution for this, it is here. It is at hand. But David sets out. He, he leaves. I, I didn't say this at the beginning, um, but, but the next several chapters, we're actually going to go from chapter 15 through chapter 20. It's all one long story of David and Absalom, of the rebellion, of the civil war in the kingdom of Israel. And you're going to see this consistent theme happen throughout of like departing and, and entering into cities or moving around to different areas. So we have here departing, we have David. He sets out and the entire household followed him. I love that. In verse 16, 
The literal translation is they were at his feet. They were in his feet. It's saying that there is literally no step that David takes where he is not followed by a loyal and faithful household. Even here, God is saying, I will, I will provide people for you. You are not completely alone. And so they leave. They go out through the east side of Jerusalem. They're heading towards the Kidron Valley. They stop at the last city, it says, or the last house. And I think it's almost like pausing at the city limit sign. And it's almost, you know, you can imagine just looking back and saying, how did we get here? How, how did this happen? What, what steps did we, what, what went wrong for us to get to where we are at this moment? How in the world am I a king of God's kingdom and I'm having to run from my life from my murderous son? I mean, think, think about the heartbreak that was involved here. Think about the realization of the weight of his sin and the consequences of his sins. David is having to face up to the consequences of his sins. I wish I could, I, I could provide an easier path, but one of the hardest things in the Christian life is that you have to face up to the consequences of your sins at times as well. And not only that, but we have to be part of the active fight of putting those sins and that sinful desire, our, our hearts that are bent towards anything that's not the Lord, we have to put those things to death. This is called mortification. It, it's part of, of being sanctified, of being made more like Christ. You are putting to death, literally the root word mort is death. You are, are making dead the old man so you can make alive the new man in Christ. This is not your own strength. This is not your own action. This is done when in, enlivened, when, when indwelt by the spirit that you are able to accomplish this. When we face up to our sins, when we put to death the old man, we are fulfilling the idea that Paul wrote of in Romans 8, uh, verses 12 through 13. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit, if indwelt with God's Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We have to face up to the consequences of our sin. We have to put to death the old man so the new man can come to life. And, and, and especially when our sins cause damage to others, we need to own up to them. We, we need to make right something that we have done wrong. Let me use an illustration. Let's say you're, you're going to, to get some groceries later today and you, and you scrape another vehicle in the, car, or in the parking lot. You know, you, you cause damage, nothing, nothing major, no one's injured, but you cause damage to someone else's vehicle. Now, the, the world solution, the, the secular answer, is to say, well, I'll just put my number on the, on, on the windshield wiper, or I'll let, you know, the insurance adjusters decide, or I'll let, you know, some small claims court judge give out a ruling, and I will pay whatever they tell me to pay. That's, that's the right answer in some ways, but it's the bare minimum. I would argue the Christian response is to say, I need to go above and beyond. I, I, I will wait here until I meet this person face to face and say, I did something wrong. I am sorry. I want to make this right to you quickly and, and fully. Now, I'm not saying insurance is bad. I mean, say we'll go through that process, but I, I want to make sure that a wrong that I committed, even if accidental, is one that I take care of quickly because I want to own up and, and, and feel the consequence of the wrong that I did to someone else. I will restore and make right the wrong over which I have full ownership. It's, it's good to face up to those. It's good to understand the weight and consequence of our sin, and yet sometimes sin comes with tragic consequences. There are two major consequences here for David, two that we see in this section. The first one is that David is realizing that the day of reckoning for his past sins are now, is now upon him. If you think about it, with Bathsheba and with Uriah, he committed sexual immorality and he committed murder. And then very quickly, he had sons that committed sexual immorality and committed murder. He took from someone else and now he has a son that is taking from him. He refused to lead as a king for years and now he has someone who's willing to step in, the place, in his place and to be the leader that he's not being. David's sin resulted in the, the closest relationship he has, the, the, the earthly relationship, his family turning against him, breaking apart, and even trying to murder him. I mean, if you think about it, the, the final words that Julius Caesar gives up in the play by William Shakespeare, he says, et tu brute. It's Latin for, and you, Brutus, even you. It's, the, it's a dying man's final words of saying, 
Even my closest friend, my trusted advisor, the one I thought was almost like a family member, is among the conspirators that are murdering me. It's the tragedy of being uh, abandoned, of being abused, of being uh, taken advantage of by your own family members. It's meant to hurt. And that is one of the tragic consequences. The other one, it's almost one that you can gloss over. You think that you read it at the high level and you think, okay, we've got it. But it's huge. It it results in him abandoning his role and his place as the king of Israel in the city of Israel, uh, over the the city that is meant to carry out the the reign of God's people in the promised land. This is not a small thing. This is David losing his title that was placed on him, his anointing as God's leader, his favor as a man after God's own heart, and the sin is costing him his his title, his his place, what God has said is a defining characteristic of him. You as my king over people, you cannot, you, that, that office is no longer functionally yours until we go through this, the next, through, next several chapters. It's meant to be painful. We see a king fleeing a city. We see a son rebelling against his father. We see men failing in all ways. And that would be a tragic way to end this sermon. Thank goodness we have another 18 verses that we'll go through very quickly. Um, In verses 19 through 37, we see a Lord who keeps his promise. The Lord keeps his promise. In the midst of a total downfall, the Lord provides for David, particularly through the people that he meets. In this chapter and then in the first half of next week's chapter, we're going to see several different people that David meets. And and what you learn, especially with the blessing of hindsight, is that this is a way that God is providing certain things through certain people for David and protecting and providing for him. The first one that we see is Ittai in verses 19 through 23. Ittai is someone who has no reason to be faithful to King David. He just arrived as a political refugee um, uh, in Israel. Israel. If you see, he's from Gath. If you really know your Bible geography, Gath is one of the prominent cities of the Philistines. This is where Goliath's hometown is. I mean, this is literally saying, you are, you are from the city that I dominated. I, I beheaded your greatest warrior, and now you're coming to me for, for protection. And sure enough, as soon as you get here, I'm on the run from a son that's trying to kill me. He has no reason to be faithful to David. He even tries to tell him. He says, go. He's like, go back there. And yet we see, I love this, in verse 19, he says, why are you going with us? With us, there is a play on words because in Hebrew, it sounds just like Ittai. It's saying, why why are you Ittai? Why are you with us? And he says, as long as you live, as long as the Lord lives, I will be with you. This reminds me of Ruth chapter 1. We studied Ruth this past summer. I'd I'd encourage you to go back and listen to those or read through the book of Ruth, but it's beautiful there. In Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Ruth is is married to to one of Naomi's sons. Uh, Those two sons die in a foreign land, and Naomi is trying to return to Israel. When We we see her tell her two daughters-in-law, who are now widows, to say, stay with your people. You have better prospects. You have a better future here. And one takes her up on it and stays in her native land, and then Ruth, in a beautiful, almost poetic phrase, says the following to her mother-in-law. Ruth replied, don't plead with me to abandon you or or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely if anything but death separates you from and me. That is a faithful statement of where you go, I will go. I will literally be in your feet. I will be following you wherever you are going. And this is what Ittai says to David. I will be with you. I I am. I'm with you in all that we do. And so he says, go forward. Let's let's march together. They approach in verse 23, the the valley Kidron or the Kidron Valley, and, and they're marching out on the east side of Jerusalem. This is a small point, but it's important to realize that, that biblically speaking, we're almost seeing a return to the Exodus mindset. We're, we're moving away from the settled area, the, the city dwelling of God's city in Israel, and we're returning out to the wilderness, to the unknown. You know, this happened at the end of, of, the, of the Exodus, where they, they went in underneath Joshua, underneath the judges, and, and God settled his people in the promised land. And yet, because of their unwillingness to deal with sin, they 
they are, they're being cast out again. God's king is being cast out into an unknown future because of the wrong that he has done and the wrong that he has tolerated in other people. But he has Ittai. He has someone with him. He also has Zadok. Zadok comes up. He's, he's a priest with the Levites. He brings the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant with him to say, if we're going to fight, we're going to fight with the best weapon we have. We're going to take this, this talisman that, is, that has made us un, uh, invincible in battle, and we're going to take it, and we're going we're to take it to your son Absalom, right? But we see David, we see David say, hold on, that, that's not the right approach anymore. And, and I really want to say, we, we need to understand Zadok a little bit, because guys, we're guilty of this too. I mean, I, I'm not going to ask anyone to raise hands, but who here has not said, honey, I promise if I buy this one tool, it'll make this job way quicker, way easier, way faster. I mean, I just built bookcases and sure enough, we now have a paint sprayer. So it's worth it. <laughs> it's saying, if I have the right tool, everything will be easier. But, but what David realizes and that Zadok doesn't is that the ark is not a tool. It's far more important than, than some little religious talisman to use at our own disposal for our benefit. He says, that belongs in God's city. I don't belong in God's city. He says, send it back. And he says, if the Lord judges me, if the Lord finds favor with me, great. However, if he says, I do not delight with you, then here I am. Literally, it means I am ready for whatever the Lord has, or whatever the Lord uh, pleases him, not me. David is going to still faithfully work to restore his kingdom. And he says, rather than this tool, I need information. I need you to go into the kingdom. I need you to go among the people and, and, and hear how things are going and report back to me. I, I need to know the latest intel so, so I, can, I can make a proper plan to restore my throne over Israel, over Jerusalem. And then we finally see in, Zada, or in, in Hushai, we, we, see, uh, we see answers. We, we see in verse 31, right at the very end of this, we see that the terrible news comes to David, that, that the, uh, his closest advisor, one of the, the people that are closest in his court, Ahithophel, has now turned. His heart has been stolen by Absalom. And he says, Lord, please turn this man's counsel to, to my rebellious son into foolishness. And very, the very next verse, we meet Hushai. Now, if you don't know, uh, we're going to see a lot more of him. We're going to see that he is an, an embodied answer to prayer. This is, uh, this is someone who will step into the void and faithfully serve. We, we, this is the literal uh, chance where, where God is saying, you want an answer? He's right here, and you're, you're going to meet him. It almost seems like he sends him on a similar mission. Uh, I want information. You're not alone in here. But he's saying he's part of a greater plan uh, for the, the council to be made foolish in Ahithophel as he uh, interacts with Absalom. You know, it's, it's amazing to see what God has provided. God provides assurance in Ittai, assurance that David is not alone. He provides information in Zadok. He says, whatever information you need to, to make your plan to, to resume your throne, it will come through Zadok. And then he provides answers to prayer in Hushai. He, he says, this is the embodiment of, of I am being faithful to you. Where, and maybe more importantly, who is God providing in your life at this time? Who has God placed around you to provide answers, to, to provide assurance, to provide information? I mean, the obvious, the obvious relationships such as family and friends are, well, they're obvious, right? But, but who are the men and women of faith, of, of great uh, submission to the Lord's word, who are helping you along your walk of faithful obedience? I mean, if, you, if names and faces that you can see regularly throughout your week face-to-face -face don't come to mind, I'm going to challenge you. They're right here. They were in the nine o'clock service. It is this local congregation, this local expression of the kingdom of God that, that God has placed around us to experience his assurance, his care, his love, his compassion. If you don't have that community, I challenge you this week, join a community group, come to discipleship groups, experience fellowship, experience discipleship, experience the highs and lows of, of getting to know brothers and sisters in Christ. So we see that Man fails in, in all ways, and yet God is faithful always. When we read a text like this, as we start to conclude, I want to make sure I've got it right there, good. When we read a text like this, it's easy to, to maybe read this and say, okay, how does this get us to the gospel? I mean, I see some bad things, I see some good things, what's going on here? 
It's easy to see glimmers of the good news, but that's often because whenever we first read it or when we read it through our, our modern eyes, we can miss the forest for the trees. This is a, a foreign text in a foreign land in a foreign time, but guess what? This passage speaks to us. This passage cries out to a need which is greater than Abraham's grievous or Absalom's great grievous fault, and it's beyond David's capacity to deliver. Our sin is more immediately dangerous to our heart posture, heart posture before God, and, and, and we are unable to deliver ourselves. We are unable to deal with sin on our own the way that we need to. When we look at the rebellious Absalom, you and I need to say that we are rebellious sons and daughters. We have rebelled against the Father's will. When we look at David, as so many other times, we need to say, I'm not looking to him. I'm not looking to him as the perfect example. I'm looking to who he's pointing towards. We are meant to look ahead to his his kingly offspring, to, to the king that is coming later on in the, in the scene. We see Jesus Christ himself. If you don't believe me, let's go back to verse 23 for just a second. It says, everyone was weeping loudly while all the people were marching out of the city. As the king was crossing the Kidron Valley, all the people were marching past on the road that leads to wilderness. You know, it says here that David was leaving Jerusalem. He crossed the Kidron Valley, which has a brook at the bottom of it, and he climbed the Mount of Olives. The Gospels, when you piece them together, particularly in John, tell us that Jesus left the city of Jerusalem cross the brook Kidron, and climb the Mount of Olives to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. This is the night before he died. Don't believe me? Let's, let's look. David's kingdom was in doubt. It was unsure of who would be the ruler. The followers of Jesus were also unsure. He had just prayed over them, and they were still unsure of who or how this kingdom would come to fruition. But thanks be to God for the differences between David and Jesus. David was running from this city to save his life. Jesus was going to this mountain to give his life. David was paying up for the price of his own sins. Jesus was paying for, people, for other people's sins. David was there because of a disobedient son. Jesus was there because he is the true and obedient son. If you don't see it, the passage screams of it. Jesus is the truer and greater David, the truer and greater king of the truer and greater Israel. You and I, the, the good news today is that we get to be citizens of that Israel, of that kingdom, simply by declaring that the one who rules over it is also the one who rules and is king over our hearts. So as we wrap up today, how do you see Jesus? How, how do you see yourself and Jesus? The, the message today is that without him, you and I are nothing but a series of failures. We are defined by the ways that we fall short, but with him, and in him, and through him, and by him, by Jesus Christ alone, we see that he is the fulfillment of our greatest hope, our greatest love, and our greatest peace. Men fail in all ways, but God is faithful always. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this wonderful reminder, this wonderful truth that we could never move from, never move beyond, that you uh, you love failures, and, and, you, and you pursue people who do not deserve your love. While we were still sinners, you died for us. We thank you for that amazing truth. We pray that we are shaped by it and go spread that good news to others who do not yet know it. God, we love you. We trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and respond with uh, the doxology. Praise God from the I hope that you'll join us over the next several weeks as we hear how God resolves this story of how he, he reconciles a, a king with his kingdom. But until then, uh, you know, they never met uh, in person or on earth, but I know they're rejoicing together in heaven. And whenever Paul wrote these words, I, I know that they're probably very familiar to, to David as he was running from his son. 
If you're willing, you can hold out, the, hold out your hands as, as you receive the word before we go out today. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he says, More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that, I, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. You have a righteousness that is not your own because of the faith you have in the righteous one. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have a wonderful week.